This episode is brought to you by The Java Can, a ruggedized mobile coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's 10%. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. Live life charged. More people listen to podcasts than go to the movies on the weekends. So why doesn't your business have its own podcast? I'll tell you why. Because you don't know where to even start in the process. You don't want it to sound like you're recording in your mom's basement. And you simply don't have time to learn how to record, edit, and master the sound. Let ClearCommo take the stress out of podcasting and help you produce a high-quality podcast to share your company's message with its customers and future customers. If you're not in charge of your message, someone else is. So take charge today. Let us help you make a clear message with ClearCommo. Go to www.clearcommo.com and start your company's podcast today. Folks, the latest book on my must-read list is one that honestly might save your life. It's 365 Days of Survival by the folks at Captive Audience. This book has 365 days of tips and lessons of survival from people in the special operations world, law enforcement, and survivors. These tips span from wilderness to urban survival, natural disasters, and crisis planning. Be a force multiplier. 365 Days of Survival is available now on our website, theaarpodcast.com. Fortune favors the prepared folks, so don't wait to wish you knew what to do, know what to do with 365 Days of Survival. Go to theaarpodcast.com, scroll down, and order your copy of 365 Days of Survival today. And welcome to the After Action Review Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez. It's finally getting to feel like spring out here in D.C. Everyone is going crazy for these damn cherry blossoms, which means insane crowds and insane traffic. This is like a larger, dumber scale version of the Texas blue bonnet fever that sweeps through central Texas every year. My folks in uh, San Antonio, Austin, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. It's even worse here in D.C. These folks, they take it to another level. I'm telling you, all in all, though, I'm glad to be done with this cold weather, putting the jackets away. I'm glad to see them packed up, and hopefully we don't see them for a very long time. Keeping the hoodie out, though, for sure. Now, I've been pretty busy on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I've been pretty busy on LinkedIn lately. I've been learning a lot about the power of networking and how some of the pros are doing it. Now, I'm leveraging LinkedIn a lot more than Facebook uh, simply because it's the place where folks interested in business are. So if you're not on LinkedIn, you should be. I'd love to connect with you and your business. Or if you have an idea for a guest, that's a great place to to message me. Or if you have questions about business, I can connect you with folks who are a lot smarter, a lot more talented than me and uh, people who've been there. I think that's the important part of this show, folks, is I'm not a business expert. I'm not here to give you all sorts of crazy advice or tell you what you should and shouldn't do. Um, There are far smarter people that have been my guests that have uh, come through this uh, podcast and I'd love to connect you with those folks so they can answer your questions. So get on LinkedIn, find me. If you don't know where I'm at, uh, that link is on uh, our podcast website, uh, www.theaarpodcast.com. You'll see me there in the bio. Click on the LinkedIn and you will find me link in with me. I can't wait to share some of that knowledge. We share some of my guests with you. So anyways, uh, all right, so let's get to to today's episode. She has the face that makes you say, hold on, I know her from that one show. She's an accomplished actress, model, mom, veteran. And as you'll find out, she has some titles that might surprise you. From the hit show, Stranger Things, my guest is the talented and wonderful Jennifer Marshall. 
Hi there, I'm Jennifer Marshall. I'm best known as Max's mom on Stranger Things. I served in the United States Navy for five years. Jennifer, thanks for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. Uh, not only your professional one, but the personal side. I know you're having issues with uh, water and pipes and you know what? I understand. Everybody listening right now can empathize <laughs> with that struggle. Everybody who's owned a home is like, I hear you, sister. I hear you. Yep. Plumber, uh, plumbing issues, pipes. Uh, we just recently had to replace our entire uh, HVAC, everything. Like it was a complete mess and it never breaks. Things never break at a convenient point. No. Our, no. <laughs> no. Our, our air conditioner broke in the middle of a Texas heat wave. Uh, and then our heater broke literally the day it snowed for uh, two days here in D.C. I was just like, really? Now, now you want to break? Now you want to break? Okay. Well. We had our flood during the holidays. So, of course, nobody's available to do the construction. You know, they pulled everything out, of course, because SurfPro can come pull everything out. But then you try to contact contractors, and, of course, nobody wants to spend their Christmas rebuilding your house. <laughs> of course not. So, Jennifer, tell me a little bit about uh, your transition, maybe a little bit about your time in the Navy, and how did you end up going from, you know, the Navy life to being Max's mom on argu uh, arguably the most popular Netflix show ever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's weird. I never would have thought when I raised my right hand at 17 that this is where my life was going to go. Um, I grew up in a, in a small one stoplight town and there wasn't really a lot to do. My mom wanted me to be a flight attendant because she thought, you know, you'd be able to get out into the world and travel and see things. But that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I came from a family with nine veterans in it and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I joined the Navy at 17, had my 18th birthday in boot camp. I don't recommend that. <laughs> Not the best way to spend your birthday. And um, I was in the Navy for five years. My first command was San Nicolas Island, which is a missile test site off the coast of California, and my second command was the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And on the Roosevelt, I deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And then I got out, and yeah, now I'm here. So <laughs> it's a pretty crazy, it's been a pretty crazy trip. So has being an actress been something was that something that was on your mind when you left the the, the Navy? No, no, no. Uh, you know, a lot of actors that I work with, they say, oh, I knew I wanted to be an actor from the time I was a kid. And that's just baffling to me. It was never something that I thought was even a rem remotely a possibility for me. And it was something that other people did. And I knew that other people did it. But how do you even get started in something like that? How do you even make the transition? How do you move? How do you get an agent? All of these things are just... You know, it's just, it's, it's crazy talk, really. So no, I never expected that this is where my life was going to, you know, what it was going to turn out to be, but I'm thankful that it has. How does this happen? Where, what was the first inkling? Like, Hey, maybe this entertainment thing is, maybe that's my bag. Well, I had done musical theater in high school. So, but I still went to a small high school. It was, <laughs> it was a graduating class of 79 people. So it was super small, um, did musical theater, went into the Navy. And then I remember my last year in the Navy following our deployment, one night I was on the mess decks and there was this really colorful poster that caught my eye. And, you know, the mess decks are completely gray and everything's kind of drab. And the poster said, come join our theater group. And the theater group was on base at Little Creek Amphibious Base in Virginia. And it was only open to military, retirees, dependents, um, veterans. And I thought, well, I, I'm not that good where I think I could do it on another level. But if it's limited to kind of just our community, I think I could probably maybe book something. So I started doing shows with them. And I actually gravely underestimated uh, the talent level, because the talent level was really good in that group. Um, but people don't tend to equate military with acting or military with that sort of talent. So, um, you know, after a few shows, there was a guy who was a retired chief in my group. And I saw him on a local commercial. And I said, Dave, how did you get to be on that commercial? And he said, oh, I take classes at this acting studio by this guy who won an Academy Award as a student. So I started taking classes there. And within the first two weeks, I booked my first gig. So... It was through that school. That school, I assume, then had the ends with those industry people 
to say, hey, look, this is the person or? Well, no, it, because that was local. So it was in Norfolk, Virginia, but it basically was a place where I could meet with other actors. You know, one of my teachers was a working actress and it just kind of familiarized myself with the basic stuff that you learn as an actor. And so many people say, you know, I'm naturally good as an actor. And so I think I'm going to go out and just blow them away. And I'm the first to say you can have natural talent, but if you don't understand camera angles and lenses and onset terminology, nobody is going to hire you because time is money and that clock is ticking. So when I went to school and I've trained my entire career, but when I went to school, I really got a good foundation to where I could go out and then book things and casting directors would know, okay, she understands what it's like on set. She's going to go and be professional and not waste time and not waste money. It That seems to be a very uh, prominent theme whenever I talk to veterans who've gone into the entertainment industry is understanding that time is money. You can't, there's no OJT, it seems. And that's something when you join the army, when you join the, the the military, OJT is all you know. They send you to tech school. They t- send you to AIT. But honestly, that's almost like an extension of basic training. You learn everything once you get to your unit. That's not true in the entertainment industry necessarily. You show up, you have to know your job. Well, and and that's the thing is, you know, when you go on a network set, like when I shot Hawaii Five-0, I was a guest star. I played Lieutenant Colonel Bailey on Hawaii Five-0. You go on set and you go to shoot and there is at least a hundred people standing around watching the scene being shot. There's hundreds of people behind the scenes. So yes, time's ticking, time is money. So I think that the OJT comes in earlier in your career when you do student films and you do independent films and you do, you know, PSAs and you do low budget commercials. That's kind of the time for you to have your OJT and it's okay because that's a learning environment. And I think a lot of people, they kind of want to skip that and they want to say, well, I just want to be on Criminal Minds. Does that happen? It does, but you kind of have to work your way up the ladder. You know, you don't come into the Navy as a chief petty officer. You don't come into the Marine Corps as a gunnery off- as a gunnery sergeant. That's not a thing generally. So, uh, you know, unless you have some incredible, amazing talent, but it's kind of the same way in TV. If you are maybe a completely tattooed little person and they need a completely tattooed little person, is it possible you'll have a, your first network guest star? Sure. But for the most part, that's not really how it works. Take me through the experience of coming from a small town. You did your time in the Navy. You did a little bit of theater work. Maybe you've been in a commercial or two. But but now you're on a television show and millions of people are seeing you. And you're seeing yourself. What was that like the first time that you that you had ex- that you went through that. Oh, it, it was surreal. When I booked Stranger Things, I knew it was huge. You know, I was a fan of the first season. I had loved it. When I auditioned, I, I didn't audition thinking, oh, I'm gonna book this. I knew that there was a a good chance as long as my audition was good, because Sadie, who plays Max, we look so similar. I had taken a picture of me and put it next to her and showed my husband. I had been a fan of Sadie's work. She had done another show called American Odyssey that I watched her on. And I always thought she was incredibly talented. So I knew that there was a shot. But at the end of the day, if they're auditioning every redhead in Atlanta for that and also outside of Atlanta, you know, what are the odds of booking that? Clearly, it's better odds than, you know, if they opened it up to women of all races, women of all you know, hair colors, then that's different. So it was kind of limited. But, you know, I was fortunate in the fact that I really, really, really saw the value in a foundation. And I tell actors this all the time. Don't try to build a house on some hill because it's just going to be a shanty. It's going to fall down. You're not going to have anything in five years. Make the strongest foundation possible and you can build the Burj Khalifa if necessary. But you have to build that foundation. So, It was definitely a journey. I did not book that overnight. You know, I've been working in this business off and on since probably 2005. So it definitely was just let me see how much I can book. By the time that I had booked Stranger Things, I had shot 50 commercials. So I had shot 50 commercials. I had done some some television, some movies. So I definitely had worked my way up. Um, and when I was on set, I that helped because I wasn't nervous. I mainly just thought, this is an amazing opportunity. I'm happy to be here. 
but I've I've earned this and I'm I'm honored to work with these actors. But I definitely wasn't nervous because I had built that foundation, if that makes sense. Yeah, you you were going in there as a as a veteran in very in many respects. Like you this wasn't your first dance. So yeah, I could I that's very interesting to me because so many veterans are making content now. So they're out there, they they get out of the, the military and they're making YouTube videos, Instagram, um, Snapchat. They're becoming social media stars and they're all looking at, at people like you and they're saying, I want to get there and they're, and they're forging their own paths. Being where you are and knowing that you've got these goals of where you want to go, what's your advice for folks who are on those social media platforms and they're killing it, but they're, they're having difficulty finding that next jump. So I would say there's kind of a misnomer that because you are successful in the social media realm, that that is going to translate into bookings in the entertainment industry. Now, is it possible that, um, you know, you have a following? Is it possible that you would get a reality show based on that following? Absolutely. Is it, possible that you would be cast in some sort of veteran collaborative show that's possible too but you really have to it's just like any other job it's like if you want to be a dentist you wouldn't just go on youtube and do dentist videos <laughs> and talk about you know being a dentist and being a veteran and how being a veteran relates to being a dentist and hey i've got some cards but i've never went to dental school do you want to come on down and i'll drill your tooth Nobody would say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And there was a trend in casting social media stars for a while. But when they got on set, you know, producers would realize, ooh, this person can't really act. This person can be themselves and this person's really interesting. But if I need a certain something, I can't get that from this person. So I would say if this is something that you do want to do, it's like any other career. You have to get training specific for that. And I'll give an example. There was a gunnery sergeant who had got out of the Marines and he had started, you know, acting. And he said, I don't want to do be an extra anymore. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do this. I want to go be like on a show as a series regular. And I said, well, with all due respect, I said, if an actor had played a gunnery sergeant for, you know, maybe four or five times, should that actor just go into the Marine Corps as a gunnery sergeant? And he said, well, no, that's ridiculous. And I said, well, what you're advocating for is ridiculous because you're asking a production to take you on and it's a huge financial risk and just say, oh, you don't have training. You don't have this. You don't have that. You could massively blow us into overtime, over budget, and that means cancellation. They just can't take that chance. So I always tell people, whatever you want to do, get some training in it. Definitely. It's an investment in yourself. So right now we are in <clears throat> a world where it seems like the veteran status has been heavily politicized. Um, people are using the veteran status and veterans in general to to push personal agendas, to push political agendas, to push uh, you know private agendas. Being a veteran in Hollywood, in that community, in the entertainment industry, how have how has that changed over the last couple of years and you know through your experience and is it something that's impacted you you know i'll be honest with you um there are a few offices that that i have heard will not bring in anybody that they believe to be conservative for some reason um i think civilians think that all veterans are conservative i don't go into politics but i'll say this um there are a lot of conservative vets here. There are a lot of liberal vets here. Acting is more of this profession that's kind of, it, it brings kind of liberal-minded people here. So I always kind of err on the side of caution of just because a person's a vet doesn't necessarily mean A, B, or C. You know, my favorite offices have seen veterans as an asset. Like, okay, we are going to bring these veterans into audition knowing that they bring a some, something a little extra to the role. You know, we were indoctrinated for two to three months in boot camp to be a soldier, sailor, marine, airman, or coast guardsman. That did not come overnight. So when you bring a civilian in to audition for these roles, unless they have ROTC or they even if they have ROTC, sometimes it's not enough of that. Yeah. 
So they bring something additional to the role at no no extra charge. And I think that casting directors can see the importance and the value in bringing in vets who have training for these roles. Now, does that mean we always book it? No, it doesn't. They're not, you know, I don't go in there expecting a job because at the end of the day, the best actor is going to book it. But just to be brought in is is great. Like we're not asking to be cast. Just bring us in and see what we can do. And And a lot of offices here are really great about that. And I'm very thankful. I think it's interesting how there are assumptions and whether it's a political assumption or a health assumption, there are assumptions that people make about veterans in general. You know, you have PTSD or you've been overseas, you've been deployed. Well, that's not necessarily true. There are, you know, a millions, uh, well, maybe hundreds of thousands of veterans now who um, maybe didn't go to combat. Maybe they never served OIF, OEF, or they were in a, you know, they just, they're, they're okay. They're not PTSD. They're not any health issues, but they're not, they're not a liability. And I, I think a lot of people see uh, veterans as a liability, as a political liability too. That whole idea that we're all conservative or we're all this, or we're all that, that blanket statement. Um, that's a kind of a frightening thing, especially for vets who want to go into the entertainment industry because they understand I'm going to be in the limelight, whether it's, you know, a, a movie or show, it doesn't matter. I have to be active in social media. There's that hesitance to to go out there because now I'm going to be held under this microscope. Well, and that's why I'm really thankful for, you know, like you said, the limelight, however, however much I have, I'm very thankful that I have that because I can advocate on behalf of veterans and say, listen, does post-traumatic stress run in our community? Yes, it's something that happens in our community. But to say, oh, as the media, we're just going to, you know, have this negative narrative about vets and how we're all broken and how we're all this and all that. I don't want that. There are a lot of positive things going on in our community, and it's important to recognize both sides of that. Do we have our issues? Do we have brothers and sisters that we need to help? Absolutely. But we also have vets who are business leaders, who are politicians, who are community leaders, who are parents. We have vets who are kicking ass. And if I can be a part of shaping that narrative and showing some positive stories, then that's definitely what I want to do. Now, one of the things I've seen you very active in is a group called Pinups for Vets. And I've seen your uh, the pictures that you've posted on your Instagram. And in every single one of those pics, you cannot be smiling more. You just seem so happy and so energetic to be out there and supporting these, these generations of veterans that have come before us that really paved the way for all of us. Tell us a little bit about your, your involvement with this organization. I love Pinups for Vets. Um, it has allowed me to give back to the veteran community and connect with my veteran sisters. It's an amazing organization. It's award-winning. We're congressionally recognized. We dress up as World War II era pinup girls and we visit veterans in hospitals and nursing homes and wounded warrior detachments. And at the end of the day, when we leave a visit, we know that every single veteran knows that his or her service is appreciated and that they're not forgotten. That has been so important to me living here in Los Angeles, being able to connect with other veterans and being able to give back. And I think that a reason so many veterans struggle, myself included, when we left the military was the camaraderie. There's a there's a loss of camaraderie. There's a loss of, you know, these are my teammates and in the Navy, shipmates. You know, these are people that I could rely on to have my back to to save my life if necessary. And you get out and you try to explain your experiences to civilians and they don't understand. They just don't understand. And Pinups for Vets has allowed me the opportunity to connect with so many people. And I'm so thankful for the organization. That's amazing. Uh, and I believe uh, the the founder of that organization, her name escapes me right now. Gina Elise. Gina Elise, we spoke briefly and she wants, to, we're going to do an episode of the AAR podcast. I'm very excited to talk more about that organization. So part of an AAR is we always talk about what's gone right, what's gone wrong, everything in between, but it's the what's gone wrong piece that always throws people for a loop. Is there anything that you feel looking back on your transition from the Navy to where you are at now that you think, hmm, that didn't go the way I thought it would. I would have done it differently today. You know, I've been very fortunate. Um, 
I would say that a few things went wrong, but it was very short lived, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So one thing as actors that actors kind of get stuck in is listening to people's opinions. Because acting is one of those things where a lot of people are seeking acceptance from other people. They want the limelight because they want that. For me, I just kind of stumbled into it. It wasn't something that I necessarily, you know, had planned on doing. But I think for my first year out in LA, I was kind of trying to gauge, well, what does this person think I should do? And what do they think? And this, and I have been told everything from get a nose job, get a boob job, lose weight, dye your hair, cut your hair, grow your hair. It's bullshit. It's just bullshit. You know, it's not that I did any of those things for anyone. I mean, I haven't had a boob job or a nose job or anything, <laughs> but it definitely was, um, you know, something where I was like, oh, this is what I need to do to be in entertainment. No. Look at Gary Bushimi, like his, or Steve Bushimi, I'm sorry. Um, Steve Bushimi has, you know, teeth that are very Steve Bushimi. And what if he had tried to be somebody else and he had tried to straighten his teeth? He wouldn't be the great character actor he is. Danny DeVito, like you look at all these people, Anne Dowd from Handmaid's Tale and from The Leftovers. These people look like everyday people and they've had very amazing careers because of it. So that was definitely one of the things where that I could have gotten sucked in and it could have really gone wrong, but you just have to know that you are enough and you are fine the way that you are and you can change for somebody. And then somebody else will come by and say, I don't like that change again. So you, you just can't, you have to have enough self-esteem to say, I am who I am, take it or leave it. You said Gary Bushimi. Steve Bushimi. And my, and my brain automatically made the image of the love child between Steve Bushimi and Gary Busey. And I can never that's, forgive you for that. Oh my God. That's exactly what was in my head because I have yeah. the two of them, mm -hmm. how they look. And, and that's, exa <laughs> that's exactly yeah. what was in my head. And then I was like, wait, 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 Steve Bushimi, Steve. Everybody, everybody who's listening to that just thought of a Gary <laughs> Busey, Steve Bushimi love child and is Everyone just looked away. They're like, I should never have thought of this abomination. I wish we could do like a face merge and then somebody let's not like tweet the no. face merge. Let's not do that. Hey, whoever, whoever, don't do that, folks. That's a terrible idea. So what is next for you? I'm sure that, well, maybe, you know what? I'm making an assumption and I want to ask you about that assumption. I just made the assumption that you want to do more than television. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, that's a great gig. That's way more than than most people are doing. Do you want to get to bigger roles? Do you want bigger features? Or is TV like the thing? What, what do you want to do? You know, as an actor, you have very little control over your career. You go in, you audition, you do the work. But at the end of the day... At the end of the day, it just is what it is. So I, and I think that I do tend to book because I don't put too much emphasis on it. Like, oh, I have to book this. Oh, I, I, because at the end of the day, I don't know why somebody else booked it. They could have, you know, owed the, pr the producer could have owed them a favor or maybe I'm too tall or the lead is short or somebody else has red hair. You just can't get into that. So I prefer because I'm a type A personality and that doesn't do well in entertainment. I have preferred to focus on what I can control. So I work probably two to three days a month. Uh, that's generally what an actor works unless he or she is on a series regularly. And so I have a lot of extra time. So, you know, I do a lot of things. I produced um, 15 PSAs that uh, were hi highlighting female veterans that the VA used, and they're now being purchased by a nonprofit um, to advocate on behalf of vets. So, you know, I've done that. I've I recently got my private investigation license. I went to PI school in 2014. Hold, wait, <laughs> hold on. Yeah, uh, you're not going to gloss over that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I have to stop you right there. So, accomplished actress, uh, Stranger Things. Mommy. Uh, okay, mommy. Uh, PI? Yeah, PI. I This sounds like a this sounds like a reality <laughs> show waiting know, to happen. You know, in 2014, I went to PI school and it takes 6,000 hours in the state of California to, get to California to get your license. It's really hard because the stalking laws are really strong here in California and they don't want paparazzi getting a license looking up where celebrities live and stalking their houses. So I understand that. So it's really difficult to get the license. I've been working in some capacity since 2014 with different PIs to get my hours. I graduated uh, last year with my master's in criminal justice. And so that aided in some of the hours as well. 
And in 2015, I was one of the assistants to the private investigator on the Adam Carolla show, Catch a Contractor. So we hunted down dirty contractors and we exposed them. And I worked as the decoy to lure them into the house. And then earlier this year, we shot a show called Roswell Mysteries Decoded, where uh, me and Ryan Sprague, he's a journalist who specializes in UFOs, we went to Roswell and tried to discover what happened in 1947. So it's something that I've been doing in in one capacity or another for about five years. So to open my own firm this year is super, super gratifying. I'm, I'm really excited for it. I, I just can't get this idea that, you know, you're going to go in there and you can help bust someone. They're going to be like, <laughs> don't I know you from something? <laughs> no, that actually works. I was working on a case before... And it actually worked. Um, I don't get caught often, but I, I think I've gotten caught probably three times. But when I do get caught, it's a very easy thing to just say, no, actually, I and this was back when I had a mortgage commercial running 20 times a day. So I said, no, I think I think, you know, me from a mortgage commercial. Do you watch the news? Because it runs on the news channels on Fox and CNN. And then people are like, oh, oh, OK. So it's kind of a cover within a cover, actually. <laughs> that's got to be an L.A. thing like that, that's that can only happen in LA because if somebody said to me like, oh, I'm in a commercial, I'd be like, what, what? Like, I'm in, <laughs> what? What are you talking no, about? It's a, a it's a thing because especially here, everybody mm -hmm. either works in the business or knows somebody who works in the business. So you're going to default to that. You're not going to say, yeah. oh, I bet you this is a private investigator following me. Now, if I was 50 years old and I had a fedora and a cigar and I'm this old white guy, Sure, that's what people think, but nobody looks at me and thinks like, this is what you do or this is who you are. I would not have guessed for a moment that be like, oh, that's a PI. That's definitely a PI. It works in my slash favor. It does. Actress and, and slash the, mom slash everything else. <laughs> the best part is, you know, when I'm talking to people, you just kind of play stupid and I don't know, is there any way, I'm really embarrassed, but do you think you could help me with this? And if you just act stupid... People open up their mouth. People want to help you, especially men. Oh, my gosh. You just have to act dumb. Yeah, we're dumb like that, too. We, <laughs> we see a pretty face and we're like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> what's happening? So uh, be honest with me. And I'm going to ask you this straight out. Are you trying to become Batman? Is, <laughs> no, I'm not. It seems like you're gathering all the skill sets like military military train uh, the art of the skies through hollywood and now you're just gonna become batman oh man i wish i wish i had like batman skills that would be great <laughs> so uh, it, what else are you doing so you want to do pi work um is there anything else that that what do you want to be when you grow up you know, it's so funny. I was just talking to one of my friends about that because I, I was talking about getting my license and opening my firm and they said, no, don't leave acting. Don't do it. And, and for some reason, acting, if somebody transitions out of it, and I'm not saying I'm transitioning out of it because I, I like what I do and it's, it's fun stuff. But if somebody decides to transition out of it, we all say, oh, they just couldn't make it. They left Hollywood. They quit. But if somebody, you know, is an accountant and they go to school to become a lawyer, nobody goes, Oh, that person failed at accounting. They just say, okay, this person is making a career transition. Yeah. So I, I think it's possible in your life to have many different things going on, to do very many things. And I just want to continue to grow and learn as a person. I'm, I'm looking into my second master's program right now um, because I really value education and I value, you know, just knowing things and knowledge and, and growth. And so... I'm going to continue to be 151 things. And that's partially why my husband, he loves it about me and he hates it about me. <laughs> I think it's interesting uh, because, you know, especially veterans in our demographic and our age group, you know, we are our generation of veterans. Many of us didn't join the military with the intent to do 20 years. A lot of us thought we would do a couple and then we go do something else. The generations before us, it. I, I remember my father telling me, like, stay in the army. Whatever you do, don't get out of the army. It's it's guaranteed money. It's security, retirement, retirement, retirement. And that's just not what we do anymore. The military is a jumping off point. But then we do a thousand other things. So instead of saying, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? Now it's like, what are the things you're going to do? As you grow up, 
well, I'm going to do four years as a sailor. And then when I might do three years as an actress. And then I might do four years, four or five years as a firefighter. And then I'm going to study like computer design and jump over here. And that's the new career path. Yeah. And, and I think now we recognize that, you know, just because you're jumping to different things or you're dipping your toe in different things, that doesn't mean you're unfocused. That means that you are well-rounded and you bring different things to the table. And, you know, someone had said something to me, and this has been said to me several times, but, you know, you have so much education for an actor, that's a waste of time and money. And no, it's not a waste of money because my GI Bill covered all of that. But time, definitely not, because I have a degree in international politics. I have one in criminal justice. So when I, and I have a degree in Spanish. So when I walk into an audition and they hand me a script and it's, you know, a, an officer who works for the State Department, I understand that script. A lot of actors might go in there and say, ooh, let me look this up. I don't know. And when I worked on the casting side, I would see people mispronouncing things, not understanding things, because they're just saying words. They don't know what that script means. So I don't think that any education that I have amassed has been in vain, not at all. Now, I, I couldn't agree with you more, especially as an actor, because that's your job is to chameleon into that role and you can't do it unless you know what the hell is going on especially like you know history or you know uh math and spanish these are all powerful tools that you can use in any industry so 100 percent. are we going to see you in anything new coming up you mentioned the ufo show i i, I haven't heard of this so what's coming up for you so I have a lot of really great things coming out this next year. I have a film that's going into theaters. I have a small role in that. It's called Stuber. It's with Kumail Nanjiani from Silicon Valley. Um, I had such a fun time shooting that. I have a show that I cannot talk about. Uh, the network has, mm. yeah, the network has approved it. So that will be, uh, I'll be posting on my social media about that soon. And that should be sometime in the summer. Um, and I also have a film that, you know, as an actor, we sign all these non-disclosure agreements. So it's really difficult to talk about upcoming projects. But there's a film that I'm also in next year that is a pretty controversial film. So I'm excited to see if it will... I don't know. It could be, I don't know. You never know how controversy is going to go. The so, Life and so Times we'll of Rod Rodriguez. That's <laughs> that's the name of the film, folks. It's actually, my, she's playing me. That's why it's so controversial. That's right. They that's chose right. a white, red-haired lady to play a middle-aged Mexican man. We talked about being a chameleon, so. You're so good at this. Right. Um, you know what? It's going to be great. And everybody's going to be, you know, we're, we're all anxiously waiting to find out what's going to happen. Um. So where can we see you right now? What, what do you got going on right now that we can go and, and get our fill of Jennifer Marshall? All right. So um, on IMDb, as actors, we have to go on Internet Movie Database. And so I constantly see next to my name which shows are re-airing. So if you have kiddos, um, I'm on an episode of Game Shakers that airs all the time. And I play Marlene and she runs a, a, a boy's home and she's very no nonsense. So uh, that airs a lot. And you can also go back on demand and see the episode of Hawaii Five O. And that meant a lot to me because I played Lieutenant Colonel Bailey, a Joint Mortuary Affairs officer, and it was about the transfer of a casket from uh, an airman who was killed in Afghanistan. So it was one of Hawaii Five O's highest rated episodes, I'm proud to announce. Wow. So definitely go back and, and catch it on demand because it, it, it's a tearjerker. And I was, I was so pleased to be a part of it because for those who don't serve and don't know any veterans, I think it brought home that sacrifice for the viewers at home. Terrific. And where can we find your social medias? Where are you? What are you on? I am on Facebook. So facebook.com backslash actress Jennifer Marshall. I do lives on Facebook and I love interacting with people. Like some people do lives and they just talk, but I literally go on the live to talk to people and answer questions and see how they are. And I, I've had a great support system on that. On Instagram, Jen13, Jen13, J-E-N-N-1-3, J-E-N-N-1-3. I go live on Instagram too. I'm on Twitter too, but I feel like Twitter, I got on it because I love Game of Thrones, I love Stranger Things, and I'm a nerd and I wanted to do that stuff. I feel like Twitter's a lot of politics. So I'm not as active, but Instagram, love. Facebook, love. Let's chat. Twitter, 
like like i even like, use i even use the mute function like i don't want to see oh, any politics because i don't want to be down when i go on social media i hey, oh. i get you i get you 100 percent. look i have i want to thank the people at facebook <laughs> for the unfollow button <laughs> That is the single greatest thing Facebook has ever done. Fine, you're stealing my identity and my privacy. Oh, whatever, <laughs> right. whatever. But I can unfollow this person. And you know what's funny yeah, is- and I, I, and I don't have to unfriend them. That's the best part. Right, right. Because I am such a political person in my private life. Those people who know me know that I'm so passionate about it. But the fastest way to alienate half of the people who support you is by saying, go this person or go that person I just don't. Even if you have facts and you have everything to back it up, it's just a fast way to alienate. So I really try to keep that on the DL. You can't even say go anything. No. Because if you say, go, if I said go living your life as you want it to be lived, somebody will argue like, what do you mean by that? Right. You must be anti some, I'm like, no, 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 oh, God. You must support anar anarchist governments yeah, or, or, or anarchy without government. You're like, no, no, I don't. No. I can love cats and dogs at the same time. No, whatever. <laughs> it's insane. But all right, folks. So I want to thank you again for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule out there in L.A. You're killing the game. You're representing all of us. And there are so many veterans, especially female veterans, who are looking at you as inspiration. They want to not, maybe they don't want to be actresses, but they want to be as accomplished and as well-rounded and as diverse as you are. So keep doing what you're doing and thank you again. Oh, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Jennifer Marshall, a powerhouse of talent to find out more about her projects. Be sure to check out her social media spots, all of which are in the show notes. That does it for me. Remember to buy veteran owned. Find me on LinkedIn and share, 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 share this podcast with everyone you know. I will see you at the next episode.